Hi everyone, my name is Mason. Um, I see I've got the wrong date there, it should be October 28th, but um, it is October 28th today. My name is Mason and I work for um, Comet Backup here in New Zealand. Welcome along to another Technical Highlights webinar. During these webinars I talk for about half an hour on some Comet topics. Um, so there is a Comet webinar every fortnight. Um, we alternate each fortnight. It will either be an introductory webinar for new users or a more in-depth one where I talk about um, new Comet features, best practice tips and IT industry use. Um, we've been doing this for just over a year now um, and overall we've been pretty reliable about keeping to that schedule. On the webinar platform you can sign up for notifications about when we go live and I'm coming to you live today. Um, it's 9am here in New Zealand um, on October 28th. Uh, uh, so if you're viewing this live on our webinar platform you'll see on the right hand side um, of the screen there is a chat widget so feel free to pop in any questions that you might have they'll be sent privately to me um, and then at the end of my presentation I'll have a few minutes to answer any questions. Um, so anything that springs to mind or any clarifications anything you want to answer just um, write it in and I'll do my best to answer it at the end. We are aiming for a half hour presentation only with some time at the end for questions. Um, I know all our Comet partners, IT companies, MSPs, service providers, um, you're all very busy people and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day um, to catch up on the latest Comet Backup news with me, um, so I won't waste any time. Um, after the live presentation, this webinar may be available for replay on YouTube. Um, can't take live questions on YouTube, but of course we can take questions at any time via the support ticket system, by email or by booking a phone call, so just reach out. Um, so we do this every four weeks. Uh, last time I talked about lots of major new changes that we had made in Comet. I talked about improvements to the USB recovery media builder um, with its new graphical interface and its new tools menu. Um, organizations, a new feature to create an isolated zone in your Comet server with its own users and policies. It's still being improved, but you can use it today in Voyager to implement some reseller scenarios and grouping scenarios. Um, Rebranding storage vaults. Uh, this is a new way to white label a cloud storage provider at the granularity of a single storage vault um, in the storage vault settings and also when requesting a new direct to cloud storage vault. From, from the customer's point of view the storage vault could be anywhere. Token installation. So this is a feature when you're, uh, when you're performing a silent install of the Comet Backup desktop client um, then it can retrieve its uh, username and password over the network in a more secure way. Um, and I actually talked about lots more things beside that SDK updates for our PHP and Ruby SDKs that we have published on GitHub, um, including we received several pull requests from the community last month, which was fantastic to see. Um, Cancelling jobs on sleep, which is mostly about um, avoiding some bad situations with stuck storage vaults. You know, if a device goes to sleep in the middle of a backup job, then, um, and of course Comet can still quickly resume a cancelled backup job because if a job is incomplete, any partially uploaded data chunks remain inside the storage vault until its next retention pass. Performance improvements for Windows Defender. So your antivirus um, scans every file when a file is accessed, including when it's accessed by your backup program. Um, so a lot of backup jobs up till now have actually also been a full PC virus scan, which, which is great. We love antivirus, but it should run on its own schedule, not related to your backup job schedule. So now Comet um, now avoids triggering that behavior in Windows Defender. Um, we can't add workarounds for every different antivirus product on the market, uh, but Windows Defender is certainly one of the most popular ones given it's pre-installed. Um, and we also managed to reduce Comet server's memory usage for some very large responses. If you've got over you know, 10,000 user accounts on your Comet server, or if you have someone's job report that contains a million lines of errors, um, Comet server will perform much better in those kind of you know, bit extreme scenarios. Um, so that was last month. Uh, and if you're interested in learning anything more about those topics, the previous webinar um, is available to watch again here on this platform, and it may be uploaded to YouTube in the future. Um, so that was last month. As, as for this month's webinar, there's been a lot of exciting new development in the Voyager series that I can tell you about. So I hope you've got a coffee and let's just get stuck into it. So macOS has been around for a long time, um, but in the last few versions they have been introducing additional security measures. And so even though Comet is installed as an administrator, as root, as a system-wide service, you still need to grant it um, additional permissions to access all the files on disk. Um, this is actually a really cool feature. Uh, more security measures are generally a good thing um, and can help macOS retain its famous reputation for not having any viruses. Um, you only get that kind of reputation if you can back it up. And so, so we love security measures, um, uh, but it did cause some problems for Comet because Comet needs quite a lot of permissions to read all your files. And if you're an MSP with any customers running macOS, you will probably be aware of this problem today. Um, you'd run Comet and it would run, 
uh, but then your backup job would have a million errors in it um, because Comet had no permission to access any file. And in the past, we had a workaround for this, uh, but now Comet has built-in support for prompting you as soon as it's installed um, to grant the full disk access permission. This pop-up appears, um, and then you just follow the three steps to drag and drop uh, the Comet icon into the dialog, and then you'll have the permission. And this light goes from red to green, uh, and Comet backup jobs will start to work properly again. Um, this prompting behavior with the pop-up is as seamless as it gets for technical reasons and for security reasons. There's no more integrated way of doing this. We can't do it automatically. Uh, what we're introducing is in line with industry standards for this requirement and interstitial drag and drop experience. Um, I said the light goes from red to green. Uh, actually, we have some staff members that are red, green, colorblind. Wow, I didn't know that about one in every 10 or one in every 20 adult men have some form of red, green, colorblindness, and you start noticing this pattern everywhere. Uh, so we have a text explanation as well. Um, if you were using the previous documented steps about how to manually enable the full disk access permission, um, that will, don't worry, that will continue to work and this pop-up dialog will automatically detect that you have full disk access permission. There's no further change to that. Um, one issue with the previous instructions was that we heard some partners point out that if you had granted the permission, it would be lost again when you did a software upgrade. And it took a while for us to investigate this because we weren't immediately able to reproduce the issue internally. Uh, but it turns out that having code signing enabled means that the permission was always preserved. So prior to 29.6, um, you can work around this issue by enabling code signing for macOS. Um, enabling code signing for macOS also allows you to just double click the installer instead of having to use the special right click open method. So that would be one um, definite recommendation, although it's a little bit complicated to get all the moving pieces put together. Uh, but once we noticed this fact, we were able to reproduce the issue internally and then we were able to find a solution. Um, so as of Comet 20.9.6, we no longer lose this permission. Any remote software upgrade will preserve the full disk access permission if it was set. And this takes a weight off our shoulders in terms of anything that might have possibly been um, holding you back from doing software upgrades um, is definitely something we need to remove that roadblock from you. So Comet 20.9.6 and later, uh, the full disk access permission system, it's much more streamlined, um, it's a simple drag and drop to get all the access rights you need. It's preserved, it's remembered throughout a software upgrade, so just a really nice improvement for all our Mac OS users. Moving right along, prevent creating shortcuts. Comet has a lot of policy features. Um, there's a lot of features you can turn on and off with the software, and we've seen a really broad variety of MSPs sign up for Comet. Some MSPs are very hands-on, proactive, always talking to the customer, checking in on the backup jobs and making sure everything's all right. Um, some MSPs are very hands-off. Some MSPs allow the customers to change their own settings. Other MSPs lock down all the settings and have everything managed by them only. If you're in the latter case, if you don't allow the customer to open the desktop app, um, and make their own settings changes, then you might be a little bit annoyed that Comet keeps making its desktop shortcut every time you install it. You know, if you're blocking the interface by policy, then the shortcut is just kind of useless clutter. Um, and so we've heard you, we've got something new that might help. Uh, and that something new is a flag to the command line silent installer. So if you're deploying Comet in bulk using an ADGPO or using an RMM software, um, then just put this flag in and you'll see the shortcuts don't get created. Uh, the other method is that what this flag does is it sets a shortcuts registry key to zero. So you can also pre-populate this registry key um, and then the Comet installer will read that information to know whether or not to create the shortcuts in the desktop and the start menu. So that's that nice simple feature to control whether the shortcuts are created and it should be a useful feature for those MSPs who are strictly controlling the customer experience and locking down access to the desktop app. Um, and it's a little bit technical so there's more information about it in our documentation. Database consistency with Thor commands. Wow, where do I even start? This is gonna take me a minute to get through, but the payoff is worth it. Um, so I'll start explaining from the beginning. Databases, what is a database? Um, it's, a, it's a place where data is stored in some kind of structured format. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, there's your common everyday MySQL and Microsoft SQL Server. Um, then you can go up in size to Oracle DB and SAP HANA or down in size to SQLite, Firebird. Um, databases commonly use SQL as the interface language, but they don't have to. You know, MongoDB is a famous NoSQL database. Um, sometimes a database is a program that you install, and sometimes it's just a file on disk, like Access. Um, there's so much variation in the database world, I think it's hard to pin down any stricter definition than just, you know, they store data in some kind of structured format. One interesting property of most databases is transactional consistency. Let's look at a typical application. 
uh, there's an application running, it talks to the database, this is a really rough example, but let's say we've got two sets of items, um, and you know this could be a shopping inventory between companies and an ERP system, or maybe it's like a game, like an RPG with an item inventory. Um, what I want to do for today's example is we have to remove the item from column A and add the item to column B. Um, now, if you're the DBAs in the audience, maybe you wouldn't design a denormalized database like this, but it's just an example. Now, let's try and back it up. Um, we've got two items to back up. If you just take a backup job without any special care, it's doing what we call a rolling backup job, and the backup um, app just starts reading files from the disk and makes its way through them all. Um, and if you're lucky, the update uh, steps go first, or the update steps go second, and either way, things work out. So we're, we're making a change to column A, we're making a change to column B, we're also backing up column A and backing up column B, and these four steps, update A, update B, backup A, backup B, can be reordered in lots of different ways to produce different outcomes. The database, yeah, maybe it always, um, performs those two update steps in order, and maybe the backup app always performs those two steps in order as well, but depending on which process is currently uh, the OS kernel has given the CPU time slice to, an inconsistent situation can result. You know, if things happen at just the wrong second, at precisely the wrong time, um, we'll get the updated version of A, but the old version of B. Let's look at the second column here. If the backup job has already started, and it's backed up A, and then the database manages to do both updates, and then the backup job backs up column B. Then later on down the track, what's the end result of that? that uh, what does it turn out to have done? Um, it means when you go to restore this customer's data, they find out you've got the old version of A, and that still has the item, and the new version of B, which also has the item. So after restoring, the item exists in both places. Um, and this is, this is called a race condition. And if the races were won in the opposite order, um, then the customer will find out that the item exists in neither place. Um, so that's something really bad. Uh, we're in the business of protecting customers' data, and that means we want to do the right thing here. Um, we don't want items to go missing or to be doubled up. I'm using vegetables for an example, but you know, real businesses use database for things like customer financials. Um, you can't make mistakes in a backup job. Um, so let's talk about uh, how can we make sure that the backup job is consistent, and what are the different um, consistency models for this backup job? So rolling mode, it's not a consistency model because as we've seen, it's just it's just inconsistent. Um, if the backup happens in between those two updates, um, then the item will be missing from either column or maybe it will appear in both columns. Well, you know, you're often lucky if the update um, is really fast and the backup job is very fast, then there's a pretty slim chance that you'll hit this problem. It's probably fine, especially if you take a lot of backup jobs. And then if we're talking about random chance and not a systematic problem, um, the random chance drops down, but that is not something you want to rely on, um, and it is possible to do better here. Um, this problem happens when we just read files off the disk without taking any special precautions, but there are special precautions we can take to avoid this problem. So I'm just going to list some more different approaches. Um, we could take a disk snapshot. You might be surprised to hear that this actually doesn't solve the problem at all. Uh, when you take a disk snapshot, you're asking the operating system, snap your fingers, that's the full disk, perfect as it is in that, that instant moment, and then Comet backs up from the disk snapshot, and so you've got a, a full backup of that full disk in its consistent state. But it's not application consistent, because if you look at these four steps, update A, update B, backup A, backup B, what's happened is when you take a disk snapshot, the two backup steps are combined into a single step. Um, so this second situation isn't possible because the two backup steps have been split, uh, but you can still end up in this third situation where you'll get a great disk snapshot in between the two database updates. And despite your great disk snapshot, you can still have an application level problem with your database where this item has gone missing because you've got one update but not the other. Um, so this is called crash consistency. And it's called crash consistency because if the PC crashed between update A and update B, you'd be in the same situation anyway. Um, maybe your application can recover from a crash. Uh, maybe it can't. Maybe backups are meant to be there for when the crash happens. Um, disk snapshots are better than taking a rolling backup, but it's still not really ideal. Um, something else we could try, use the built-in type in Comet. Um, Comet supports built-in protected item types for some types of databases, and these protected item types are specifically designed to avoid this problem. Comet reaches into the database using specific database credentials and access methods, and it negotiates with the database to take a fully consistent snapshot. The database knows what updates are happening, and it can coordinate this in a transaction-safe way um, to make sure that you either get both 
update A and update B, or neither update A nor B, and that way um, this, this asparagus is not lost nor duplicated. Um, this is fully application consistent, and there's no downtime. The only problem is, well, we've got built-in types for MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, MongoDB, but like I said earlier, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of different database products on the market. Um, we are expanding our list of supported protected item types, but I think there's always going to be a long tail of products that we don't have first-party support for. So if we didn't support the database software that your customers are using, um, the next best option is to do a custom integration. So if you're lucky, your database will have its own supported backup feature that gets the consistency right. Um, it's nice to integrate that into Comet like we ourselves did for MySQL and the others, but generally speaking, you can integrate it yourself. It takes a little bit more setup work. Um, many databases such as Oracle DB or Pervasive PSQL come with a VSS writer uh, that can safely take a consistent backup job of the database if Comet supports hooking into that VSS writer using the application aware writer protected item type. Or some other databases come with a separate program that can take a consistent backup job. Um, PostgreSQL comes with a PG dump program and Comet supports hooking into that two ways. You can either you know, run it as a before command to a temporary file, back up a dump file and delete it using an after command. Um, but even better, if your dump program, say PG dump again, if it supports standing out backup, you can stream the commands output directly into Comet without using any temporary spool space. And that's using the, protect, uh, the, the program output protected item type. So, VSS writer integration or dump program integration can produce an application consistent backup by using your supplied database vendors tooling. Um, but maybe your database doesn't support this. Maybe it doesn't have a built-in type and it doesn't have a VSS writer and it doesn't have a dump tool. Um, what else can you do to avoid this rolling inconsistency problem? Stop the database during backup. This sucks, it really sucks because um, it means, it does mean the database isn't changing files so it is consistent, uh, but it means downtime for anyone using the application. Um, there are some ways to improve this. Maybe your database supports just going read-only instead of fully shutting down. I know MySQL supports flush table with read lock. Another idea is if your database supports replication, then you can have a mirrored database with a primary server and a replica server. You may be able to run backups just on the replica server, just take down the replica server. But, you know, we're talking about the kind of database that doesn't have any good backup integration facilities um, then, to be honest, it probably doesn't have a good replication story, neither. Um, so anyways, in Comet, you can use a before command to stop your database service and an after command to start it up again. And this should, should be a last resort for product types that don't have any better options available. Now, that's quite a lot of background information. What I want to introduce today is we are actually here talking about a brand new feature in Comet um, to make this kind of worst case scenario just a little bit nicer to use. And that is the ability to run commands after taking a disk snapshot. Stopping the database means downtime. And even worse, when you use um, before and after commands to control this behavior, the downtime lasts throughout the entire backup job. Uh, but now with this new feature, you can restart the database immediately after the snapshot happens. Um, Comet takes a disk snapshot of the database files. You know, it takes one or two seconds total. Comet then runs your command to restart the database and then backs up the files from the disk snapshot. And the downtime has suddenly been reduced from this whole backup job time down to just a few seconds of downtime just for taking a disk snapshot. Um, so this will be a massive improvement for users of certain databases that I won't name. Um, these users will be able to reduce how much downtime is involved in their backups. In fact, if you can get the downtime short enough, you know, maybe your application will just retry connections through it and you won't see any visible problems at all. So that's, that's it. That's a new feature in Comet 20.9.7, the ability to run custom commands after taking a disk snapshot. It takes five seconds to say the feature's name, but well, a whole, whole probably 10 minutes to explain why you might need it. Um, and like I touched on earlier, there are ways to redesign your database to avoid this problem in the first place. For instance, if instead of having separate lists um, for each person, you would normally have a single list of all items and a column for who owns it, and then it only needs to be updated in one place. Um, and if the updates are what's called atomic, if there's one instant in time where things change from the logical before state to the logical after state, um, then, then a crash consistent backup using VSS snapshots would be good enough. But it's up to you to dig through your database's documentation to see if that's the case or not. Um, Comet's built-in protected item types are the best choice. They always do the right thing wherever possible. Um, taking a break from talking about the Comet Backup Desktop software for a moment, something else that's a new technical development is actually over on the account.comet.com, commentbackup.com dashboard. 
Um, you may or may not be aware, but it is actually possible to configure multiple users in your account. Um, from the top menu bar, you click your username, you click my account, um, then on the left, on the left, sorry, you click manage users, um, and then you can set up additional users under your account. So if you're a larger MSP with multiple staff members, um, then you can give your staff members separate accounts to log in here and handle support tickets. Um, there are these checkboxes below the user account um, for billing and technical notifications. We're expanding the system all the time, but for now these checkboxes do control a few things. Um, in particular, what kind of email alerts the user gets. Um, so you can make sure that your accounting staff get the billing emails, but not the technical ones. And your tech staff can get server alerts, but not billing alerts. So that's just a nice feature to have in there. Um, it's been in there for a while, but we've recently improved it to also apply to choosing what email alerts get sent out. Um, there's a third type of notification, and that is critical communications um, being sent to all user accounts. So if you or a disgruntled staff member attempts to terminate your account, uh, we send a last chance email to all um, registered email addresses, and that will be delivered to all users no matter what permission settings you have configured. It's just a, like a just-in-case measure. Um, and also, while I'm on this topic, uh, we now include your address on the invoice PDF documents. This is important for compliance in some jurisdictions, and it's nice, nice to make the invoices a bit more closely tied to your legal entity. Um, so some people will appreciate the small change to the invoice documents. Just a few more features. Um, going from the dashboard back over to the Common Backup desktop app. Uh, we now perform a network time sync when booting the USB recovery media. So we've got the USB recovery media builder this, so that um, when you're recovering from a disk image backup job, you can use this tool to create a bootable mini Windows installation that runs from a USB stick. Uh, we released this feature a few months ago in Comet 20.8.0 Jupyter, um, and we've been improving it since throughout the Voyager series. Um, one piece of feedback we noticed recently was that some people had problems with time, like they would, they would boot into the USB drive and the time would be set wrong or it would have the wrong time zone. And we've made some changes in this area to help with this. As of Comet 20.9.5 and later, the USB boot environment will resync with network time after it starts up. And this makes the boot up time take about one second longer, but probably saves you a few hours of troubleshooting. Um, so just a nice change to make the USB recovery boot environment even more reliable. Um, if you have created a USB drive media in the past, you may want to recreate the media with this latest Voyager version. Um, although it's really quick to create a USB drive. So at this stage, we just suggest creating them on demand as you need them. Automatically select USB device. Just another one for the USB recovery media dialog. Just saves you two clicks. If you've got one flash drive plugged into your PC, then just select it by default. Sensible defaults just make it faster and even more streamlined to create these recovery flash drives. SFTP default to password on Windows. So Comet supports a lot of different storage types. Um, local path, cloud storage providers like Amazon S3, Google, Azure, Wasabi, Backblaze, um, but also some plain protocols like FTP, S3 compatible, and SFTP. We often recommend people to use SFTP because it's quite modern, it's widely available, it uses strong encryption. And in particular, uh, compared to Windows network shares, SFTP has its authentication, like the username and password is embedded into the protocol itself, which means that Comet has an easier time of configuring it. Um, you don't have to worry about global net use sessions or buggy SMBV1 servers and all that. Um, so SF, SFTP is really great at solving all those problems. For SFTP, there are three different authentication types um, supported in Comet. There's username and password. Uh, there's private key, if you've set up a key pair. Or there's native auth. What is native auth? Um, native auth is if you've got a system-wide SSH setup. And um, this is used on Mac OS and Linux very commonly um, to have a single central set of authenticated key pairs, trusted known hosts, and just that centralized configuration. However, on Windows, this is really uncommon. Um, the native auth feature can be used, but it's not a good default. Most Windows SFTP users are going to be using username and password to their you know, Synology or QNAP NAS as a better replacement for, for FTP or for SMB, Windows Network Shares, just to resolve issues with global ambient authentication for SMB. Um, so that's perfect. That's really good. And Windows users generally don't need to be bothered with this native auth thing by default. So just get the default change for Windows users. And it's still there if you want it. And it's still the default for Linux and Mac OS users um, who will just honestly get more value out of it. One more thing to talk about here, use PAXTAR for better metadata fidelity. Um, so when you go to restore data in Comet, there's lots of options. Um, one of the options is to restore as an archive. Um, you can restore your files as a zip or as a tar file um, or as a squash file. 
Now, a zip file and a tar file are very widely compatible formats. They bundle all your files together, simple as that. Um, actually, there's a lot of edge cases. Um, and when you start deploying software at a very wide scale, all the edge cases definitely show up. And so we've run into a few edge cases with the tar file behavior. There's actually three different types of tar file, at least three. There's, there's, there's um, US tar, the old format from the late 80s, um, and it works everywhere, but honestly, it's a bit of a disaster. Um, with an old US tar, tar file, your modification times just get rounded to the nearest second. And um, maybe you don't care about that, but you know, a backup application needs to back up and restore with as much fidelity as possible. And so we do care about things like that. Another thing is the old US tar only supports ASCII file names. So if you have a customer who's put an emoji in their document name, um, then it wouldn't be possible to use US tar. Uh, another possible format is GNU tar's format from the 90s, which fixes some problems but has its own problems, like it doesn't support empty directories. Um, and so the latest innovation in the tar world is something called PAX tar. And PAX tar was introduced in 2001. Uh, so it's been around for nearly 20 years at this point, and they just solve all these problems. Supports high precision timestamps. They support A times. They support Unicode file names, so your customers with emoji file names will work properly. And in the past, Comet used this um, kind of auto detection, and it would switch from one format to another if it detected that would be necessary in order to support all your files. So Comet up till now was actually creating a mixed tar file. That was a mix of US tar, GNU tar, and PAX, depending on what was the you know what was needed to represent your file. Um, but that caused compatibility problems with 7-Zip, which is um, everyone's favorite unzip program on Windows. Um, we, we love 7-Zip. If you're still using the old WinRAR and you're clicking through the NAG screen every day, well, you, you did pay for WinRAR, right? Uh, but but 7-Zip is fully free, um, and it has some really powerful features involving disk image um, because it's actually able to open. 7-Zip can just directly open one of Comet's disk image VNDK backup files um, to extract individual files from a disk image backup job. Uh, back on top of tar files, so we switched tar files to use PAX tar, and this fixes a problem with 7-zip involving a mixed header error message, um, and it just brings us into the modern age a bit. Um, it does come with its own problems. You may see some extra PAX headers directories appearing in 7-zip if your 7-zip version is a bit old. Now, here's a um, public service announcement. 7-zip doesn't have a built-in software updater, uh, so it's very easy to accidentally be running a very old version if you haven't reinstalled it in a while. Um, this is particularly important because of some security vulnerabilities. If you open a maliciously crafted zip file, then bad things could happen. So it is important to keep 7-zip up to date. Uh, anyways, new versions of Comet make better tar files. It fixes some problems in 7-zip, um, and it replaces them with different but less bad problems. Um, this should be resolved fully by a new 7-zip update coming soon. And of course, command line tar, BSD tar, libarchive, core utils, GNU tar, um, all work with PAX tar files just fine and have done for the last 20 years, so no problems there.